okay in this lecture let us discuss uh, inverse z transform that is how to move from z domain to time domain okay so in the previous lecture we introduced the z transform that uh, how to move from the time domain to the z domain i mean frequency domain okay so we introduced the z transform as uh, the summation of g of n times z to the minus n so this is denoted as g of z okay and uh, the summation going from minus infinity to plus infinity so this is the definition and uh, we showed its relationship to dtft right we also said uh, the roc is uh, extremely important so without roc the z transform is incomplete then we made a special point that uh, if you have a finite sequence then the roc irrespective of whether it is a uh, causal or anti causal right or uh, combination of uh, combination of causal and uh, anti causal causal <coughs> um the roc is the whole plane okay roc is uh, the whole z plane except except possibly um, mod of z is equal to 0 or mod of z is equal to infinity or mod of z is equal to 0 and mod of z is equal to infinity so this is what we have showed for uh, causal or anti causal or combination of causal and anti causal sequences okay so the roc can be the whole z plane except uh, possibly both z equal to 0 and or z equal to infinity or uh, both z is equal to infinity and z is equal to uh, z is equal to 0 and z is equal to infinity mod of z okay the roc can be the whole z plane except both mod of z is equal to 0 and mod of z is equal to infinity or the roc can be the whole z plane except mod of z is equal to 0 or mod of z is equal to infinity or the roc can be total z plane but if it is an infinite sequence then the roc in general is an annular region if you have infinite sequence then in this case roc is an annular region it is bounded by two circles that's what we said annual region means okay so annual region is a region which is bounded by two circles so it is between two circles i have inner circle and uh, the outer circle uh, let me say the inner circle radius is r1 and the outer circle radius is r2 okay the radii of the circles um, this in the previous lecture i said rl and uh, this is rr and it is difficult to keep track of these uh, subscripts so i will simply you know i i will simplify the subscript uh, notation so inner circle radius is r1 and the outer circle radius is r2 and the radii are r1 and r2 of these two circles now for infinite sequence the roc is the annular region i will call the small cell, small circle as uh, r1 and uh, uh, larger circle as radius r2 and you can easily remember 2 is greater than 1 right so similarly r2 is greater than r1 so in that way you can remember this so it is easier to follow the roc in general is an annular region so like this this is my annular region now one can ask a question what is the you know range of my r1 and r2 right before that for an infinite sequence uh, the z transform is a rational function of the form g of z is equal to the numerator polynomial p of z divided by the denominator polynomial q of z a rational function is a ratio of polynomials right that is that's what we mean by rational function g of z is a rational function and this is equal to ratio of polynomials 
ratio of polynomials means I have a numerator polynomial and I have denominator polynomial that's it <coughs> okay and we said uh, a polynomial is a finite series okay what do we mean by polynomial polynomial is a is a finite series it should have finite number of terms okay finite series containing only integral positive powers of the variable um, in fact if you write p of z as a polynomial in z inverse um, here the variable is z inverse okay if z is a variable then p of z is not a polynomial right so <coughs> z inverse is the variable so whenever you write a polynomial in z inverse then the variable is z inverse if you write a polynomial in z then the variable is z for example when i write 1 plus z plus z squared then this is a polynomial polynomial in z not in z inverse in case if you write like this 1 plus z inverse plus z to the minus 2 then this is a polynomial in z inverse therefore this is not a polynomial in z but it is a polynomial in z inverse therefore we wrote g of z is equal to the numerator polynomial p of z and the denominator polynomial q of z and this is a rational function rational function means we said ratio of polynomials therefore if you have numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial then what we defined something called poles and zeros if you equate numerator to zero then you get zeros equate to zero in the denominator then you will get a poles and we said that the roc is bounded by poles roc is bounded by pole or poles let's say pole and we made a statement that roc is bounded by a pole at the largest distance from the origin on the other hand if it is an anti anti causal sequence then the roc is bounded by the pole which is closest to the origin for a causal sequence the roc is outside the circle like this this is the roc of causal sequence for anti causal sequence you draw a circle and now it is inside the unit circle this is anti causal you can take us you now we took some example and we showed that this and then we took some examples and uh, we made a table of the basic z transforms that is del of n and then we looked at uh, u of n then alpha to the n u of n then r to the n cos n omega naught times u of n r to the n sin n omega naught times u of n right so if you know um, the z transform of this you know basic functions then you can solve almost uh, any problem in z transform provided uh, you keep your eyes and ears open about roc roc is very very important okay in dtft discrete time fourier transform there is no such a complications okay but z transform roc is important without roc you cannot uh, define one to one transform between the time domain and uh, frequency domain okay if you know the transforms then you can solve almost any problems okay if you know the trans z transform of these basic uh, signals then you can find out <coughs> okay in z transform roc is in fact extremely important In fact, we will show that the Z transform can represent, uh, you know, different sequences. We also um, 
showed in the last lecture that there are sequences for which the z transform does not exist for example if x of n is equal to alpha to the n z transform does not exist z transform does not exist okay because it consists of two parts the right sided sequence and left sided sequence you can write this as um, the sequence from n is equal to minus infinity to minus 1 one sequence and uh, 0 to infinity another sequence this is a left sided sequence and this is right sided sequence and this left sided sequence converges to some value of alpha and this guy converges to some other value of alpha therefore together they cannot exist that we have shown in the last lecture because the two ROCs do not have an overlapping region if there is an overlapping region the circle of radius mod alpha if the uh, then you cannot you know find the ROC because on the mod alpha the, the pole is located and therefore there is no ROC so it is important to understand this okay so when you take this it transform now let's uh, mm, let's talk of the inverse z transform okay now it is similar to like a uh, inverse discrete time fourier transform now you recall that z transform g of z is equal to summation g of n times z to the minus n where n is from minus infinity to plus infinity but z in general what is z z is in general r times e to the minus j omega that's how we defined when we defined this definition and what is e to the j omega e to the minus j omega is a complex quantity right it is a complex quantity now this formula i can write g of z is equal to summation of g of n times r to the e to the minus j omega whole to the n now you can combine these two guys g of n r to the n e to the minus j omega n where n is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity now you look at this <coughs> mm, this whole thing can also be looked upon as dtft discrete time fourier transform of the sequence g of n times r to the n now we know the formula for inverse dtft therefore the inverse dtft relationship should hold here also okay inverse discrete time fourier transform what is the formula for inverse discrete time fourier transform the formula is 1 by 2 pi integral of x of e to the j omega e to the j omega n and d omega this is discrete time for a transform <coughs> and this is g of z instead of z i am writing you know x of e to the j omega so <coughs> mm, okay so i am using the variable z here so let me write down here also g g of e to the j omega okay now instead of x of n i have a you know um, let me delete this let me write down g of n so instead of g of n i have g of n times r to the n okay so in other words we should have g of n times r to the n okay so this g of n times r to the minus n can be recovered um, one second um, i wrote the formula wrongly once one minute here this is minus one minute j omega whole to the minus n and uh, if you take n inside then it is e to the my r to the minus n 
fine so now it's correct e to the j omega if you bring n here then r to the minus n if you bring n here inside e to the minus j omega m fine so this is the dtft formula inverse dtft discrete time fourier transform formula now um, in the left hand side you have g of n so that in the right hand side you have this kind of functions but now we are talking about g of n multiplied by r to the minus n therefore you multiply r to the minus n g of n in the left hand side this is equal to 1 by 2 pi integral of minus pi 2 plus pi now g of instead of e to the j omega it is r times e to the j omega okay because you are multiplying r to the minus n therefore this r is coming here and e to the j n omega t omega okay because this g of z is coming here similarly what is g of z g of z is g of because we assumed z equal to r times e to the minus j omega right this is my z therefore i replaced um, let me write down clearly see this is the inverse z transform okay this equation is inverse discrete time for a transform now what i'm trying to say here is i would like to find out inverse z transform so it it's parallel relationship therefore 1 by 2 pi integral of instead of g of e to the j omega i need to write g of z e to the j n omega d omega since i wrote g of z the left hand side equivalent time domain is g of n times r to the minus n okay now what is z here z is equal to r times e to the minus j omega sorry r r times e to the j omega therefore 1 by 2 pi minus pi 2 plus pi in limit g of r times e to the j omega e to the j n omega d omega this is r to the minus n g of n okay and uh, the small z is r times e to the j omega that is why we wrote g of z as g of r times e to the j omega now i can transfer this r to the n to the right hand side okay so g of n is equal to 1 by 2 pi r to the n minus n mm, integral of g of r times e to the j omega e to the j n omega times t omega and uh, uh, i can transfer this r to the minus n inside the integral because the variable the variable of integration is omega so 1 over 2 pi integral of g of r times e to the j omega this r n comes over here to the numerator therefore r to the n e to the j n omega d omega okay now let's restore a small z 1 over 2 pi minus pi to plus pi r times e to the j omega is z g of z this you can write r times e to the j omega whole to the n d omega what is this again z so this is 1 by 2 pi g of z z to the n d omega minus pi to plus pi and now i have you know the integrand uh, is in terms of z but the integration is with respect to omega so i need to change the variable right we must change the variable because our function is that of z here see this is my function function is that of z so i must change the variable now we know this z is equal to r times e to the j omega where this r is a constant it's a radius right r is a constant and here omega is variable 
and this z also variable therefore you differentiate with respect to omega dz over d omega is equal to r times j times e to the j omega therefore dz is equal to j times r times e to the j omega and d omega okay mm, therefore what is d omega d omega is equal to r to the minus 1 divided by j times mm, dz so this is what i got now now substitute in this equation in this integral mm, 1 by 2 pi integral of g of z z to the n d omega is r to the minus n by j dz okay so we will not put the the integral limits now okay let it be as it is okay we will come back to this later limits okay integral limits we will uh, uh, integral limits will come a little later so this is 1 by 2 pi j integral of g of z mm. then mm. i did somewhere mistake what did i do Okay. Mm. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got I missed one term here. That's why I stuck. Okay, e to the j omega. <coughs> also minus yes i am sorry because it goes to the right and left hand side it becomes okay so d omega is equal to r to the minus 1 e to the minus j omega divided by mm, j so r to the minus 1 e to the minus j omega and uh, dz right so this j has come outside of the integral then r to the minus n e to the minus j omega then z to the minus z to the n and dz and what is this this you can write uh, r times e to the j omega whole to the minus 1 therefore z to the minus 1 so 1 by 2 pi j integral of g of z z to the minus 1 z to the n dz so 1 by 2 pi j g of z z to the n minus 1 dz that's it <coughs> okay now next the question is obviously what should be the limits of this integral what is the upper limit and what is the lower limit because here z is a two dimensional plane it has no limits okay so if it is single dimension then from point a to point b i can say okay i need to do the integration from a to b but here the variable of integration is in two dimension therefore it has no limits okay it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in a complex manner okay z goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in a complex manner so how can i find the limit for this guy it is not a real quantity right so i can't say the limits 
on the other hand what was the inverse discrete time fourier transform in discrete time in inverse discrete time fourier transform we are interchanging over omega okay and omega goes over like you know on a circle from you know uh, minus pi to plus pi sorry pi to whatever it is okay minus pi to plus pi okay in other words it makes a closed contour and therefore when you go from the unit circle to the total complex plane the integration becomes a contour integration so you are moving from unit circle see we moved slow, slightly from i d t f t right to inverse z transform in inverse discrete time transform we have unit circle unit circle to z transform okay complex plane so unit circle to complex plane so in the complex plane um, to the uh, total complex plane the integration becomes a contour integration in the complex plane the integration is called a contour integration in other words what you do is you should uh, choose a contour which goes in the anti clockwise direction therefore your um, the left hand side i have g of n this becomes g of n is equal to 1 over 2 pi j so i put a circle and put anti clockwise so this is arrow mark anti clockwise this indicates anti clockwise direction okay let's call this contour as c and then g of z z to the n minus 1 dz and you know in contour integration we go in the anti clockwise direction because for omega we had gone from like this okay 0 to pi mm, pi by 2 pi by 2 to pi then like that we had gone from omega is equal to 0 in the anti clockwise direction so the direction must be the same in complex integration also but the contour must be such that it does not pass through any of the singularities <coughs> okay so contour must not pass through any singularities okay any singularities of g of z times z to the n minus 1 and uh, one of the singularity where is the singularity of this guy you take g of z times z to the n minus n you you can find out one singularity that one singularity sitting at z equal to 0 when n is equal to 1 okay so one of the singularity is at uh, z equal to z is equal to 0 um when when you put uh, you no know, n is equal to 0 okay here then you get z inverse z inverse is 1 by z 1 by z if you substitute z equal to 0 then you'll get infinity so that's a singularity point okay so g of 0 is equal to from this g of 0 is equal to 1 by 2 pi j mm g of z z to the minus n dz the singularity is located at z is equal to 0 and therefore there is a singularity for n is equal to 0 at z equal to is equal to 0 and therefore the contour is such that it is outside the poles and does not encounter any poles including the pole at the origin it should not include the pole at the origin also so if you want to draw a closed contour it must be around the point z is equal to 0 and therefore any contour c <coughs> may traversed in the anti clockwise direction which include the point at the origin is good enough and usually we choose this to be a circle which uh, uh, a circle with uh, the center at the origin so this is a uh, you know simplest thing to do however you know for uh, digital signal processing 
we do not have to evaluate the contour integration for dsp we do not have to evaluate the contour integration so then you can ask a question why are we doing all these things just for the sake of completeness i have discussed this but uh, in some cases very very rare cases we may use this contour integration but uh, majority of the time we don't need this uh, you know contour integration contour integration evaluation is not a routine job in digital signal processing um, you mean you see it has to be done with a lot of care we do not have to do it because our functions g of z is always rational right ratio of two polynomials p of z divided by q of z for rational function there are better alternatives for rational function there are better alternatives okay then the contour integration okay so <clears throat> in case if you have to evaluate this contour integral um, then the gentleman kashi okay kashi comes to rescue kashi gave a theorem called uh, kashi's residue theorem kashi's residue theorem to evaluate this contour integral okay this kashi's residue theorem which says that uh, this integral where is that integral yeah yeah this in kashi's residue theorem says that this integral is equal to sum of residues sum of residues at the poles inside the contour fortunately we do not have to apply cauchy's residue theorem we have better alternatives for uh, rational functions okay because in dsp majority of the time we will be dealing with rational functions in such a case we don't have to invoke the contour integral integral okay so therefore we are more concerned with the a method that is called a partial fraction expansion method okay so partial fraction expansion method so this is very easy to find the inverse z transform and one more method there are two three methods we will discuss one by one so we don't have to use um, contour integral method to find the inverse z, z transform instead of that we will use a method called partial fraction expansion method to find the inverse z transform and that we will discuss in the next lecture and let me stop at this point thank you very much